it. It's right on the nine, so when it gets on the three, I'm done. <laughs> Usually it's not that easy. I do bring you greetings from Big Creek Baptist Church in Wayne, West Virginia, and uh, as Brother Andy has said, every time a West Virginian comes up there, I know it's the highlight of the conference, except for this one, <laughs> but we do appreciate uh, y'all inviting us down here, and we are always look forward to the conference, and we've gotten to know a lot of the members of the church here, and uh, y'all are special to us. We really appreciate you, and uh, we want to be a blessing to you, and we know we can only do that as God leads, so you be praying for us, and we praying for you. In uh, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 is the uh, text for the Bible conference. It's also uh, our text this morning because of the important words that are in this. Galatians chapter 2, you know, the more I kept going over this and reading it, I know it's always been a precious verse to all of us, but I hope by the end of this Bible conference that it is even more precious to you, and that it's a verse that you go to often, because it's a powerful verse. It says, I am crucified with Christ, and the thought there is of of dying, isn't it? We're crucified with Christ, and and via Christ. It says, nevertheless, I live. Even though we're dead, we're alive, aren't we? Well, what are we dead to? We're dead to the world, aren't we? It's been taught last night, and the wonderful messages we've had last night, the ones that we'll continue to hear, even though we're dead, we're, we're crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. And then it says, yet not I, and I like the way this is, but Christ liveth in me. And so often we, we talk to other folks and say that we want you to see Christ. As we come up here and preach, I don't want you to hear a message that Brother Matthew Stepp preached. I want you to hear a message that the Holy Ghost delivered through. Just as much as the Holy Word is inspired by the Holy Spirit and it continue, he continues to feed us through the writings of James and, and John and, and Paul and Moses and these others. It's really God. And that's what this verse is leading us to. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me even yet today. And I like the way that was brought out last night. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Living the life in your church life. And as I the Galatians 2.20 requires a Christ-centered life. It really does. It requires that Christ be seen in us in every aspect of our lives. And, and as I started thinking about this, God has given us three institutions, and I'm, and I'm glad they're all in the program. He's given us the family, which Brother John will preach on uh, Sunday morning, Lord willing. And, you know, Christ has to be a threefold cord before our families can be successful. That's the reason there's so much divorce in this world today. It's because Christ is left out. He's not the center of the marriage. And beloved, He must be. He must be. If you haven't got to the conference yet, I want to wake you up. He must be. I want you to know that that's what the message of the conference is. If you leave Christ out, you're going to be destroyed by the world. You're not going to have any hope. Christ is our only hope in our families and in our churches and in our government. Brother Andy's going to preach on the government also, and I think it's important for us to realize, you know, we have failed in so many ways in our lives of not making Jesus Christ the center of our lives, the center of our families, the center of our churches, the center of our government. Yes, the center of our government. Why do you think our government is failing? It's because we're leaving Christ out of it. We must do everything that we can to bring Christ back into these three institutions if we are going to receive the blessings from God. Living the life that demonstrates our love, Brother Andy, as he amplified what he wanted me to preach on, I don't know if he did that to the rest of you guys or not, a couple of you guys said I, I don't know what he meant, but he amplified, he said he wanted me to preach on living the life that demonstrates our love to one another in the Lord's churches. Our love to one another in the Lord's churches. You know, I was talking to a fellow earlier this week, and I was telling him how I love to go to Bible conferences, how I love to go to church, how I love just to be around God's people. And I said, uh, I didn't know any better people in this world, whether I go to Nigeria or whether I go to the Philippines, I love to go to the Philippines and see all those, well, not Brother Bernardo, but all those other Filipinos over there, they're really good people. And I love being around God's people. 
And a, and a brother told me, he said, well, you know, it's good to be around God's people as long as you believe everything exactly like they do. That broke my heart. That he, he said, I've heard hate preached from the pulpit. And that made me want to crawl under my pew. You know, I've not really been exposed to that. I've really only been members of, of three different churches in my life. And one of them was as a missionary out of, out of Napanee, Indiana, and Heritage Landmark Baptist Church and Big Creek Baptist Church. And maybe I'm a little naive. But I like this subject, and I like this topic of loving those people in your church. But it's easy to do if they're centered on Christ. You know what happens and what causes friction in churches? is when we take our eyes off Christ. Just as surely as Peter started sinking and started falling down in the water, why, why did Peter do that? Well, you all know the answer. He took his eyes off Christ. Amen. Beloved, a church can take their eyes off Christ. Amen. And this is the first symptom of church members taking their eyes off Christ is when we stop loving one another. It's so important that that's what I'm going to spend the rest of my time on is talking about loving the brethren. I think it's the most important thing that we can do to heal our churches, to strengthen our churches, and to make life wonderful for all of us as we go to church. What is love to be? Turn over to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, and I know some others might come here, so I'm glad I'm preaching first this morning. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 13 says, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. It's a wonderful thing to be called by Christ out of the slavery of sin, out of the bondage of sin. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. Is that possible? You and I do it every day. We take advantage and presume upon God's grace and His mercy to us, don't we? God's love to us. When we sin, when we tell the little white lies, when we do things we know we shouldn't be doing and don't do the things we know we should be doing, we're sinning. Use not liberty for an occasion to flesh, but by love. This is what the Apostle Paul is turning their thoughts towards. But by love serve one another. For all the law was fulfilled in one word. And I hope you like the word law. It's the word of God is what it is. For the law, all the law, and you can talk about all the things, and if you want your cliff notes here, my apostle Paul is saying, here's your cliff notes. If you want to know what the Bible's talking about, if you want to sum it up, Apostle Paul says, all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Did you catch that last part? I left a little gap there so you guys could think, well, he's going to finish that or not. I hope that's what you were thinking, because that's not enough to love your neighbor what does it mean to love? You know, I, I, when I first came to Big Creek Baptist Church, the Lord was teaching me more than the church when I first got there. And I always apologize to the church for, for the Lord using that church to teach me so much. But I hope they learned along the way, too. You know, I, I think I, I went back there and looked, and I didn't even know it at the time. Fifteen out of my first 18 messages dealt with love and the love that we need to have for each other. Love. What is love? And at the end of that, at, at the end of six and a half years that I've been at Big Creek Baptist Church, I finally settled on a definition for love. And I want to give it to you, and I might have given it to you last year. I don't know. I like to give it to everybody. Love, simply defined, is selfless, sacrificial actions. You know, so many people think love's an emotion. Love's not an emotion. It, it really isn't. It is manifested through our emotions. But love is an action. If you say, I love you, I feel love towards you, it doesn't really do much for me until you hold my hand, until you speak tender words to me, until you help me through something that you didn't really have to help me through, but you wanted to because you loved me. Because, you know, it's, it's a selfless, sacrificial action. The most important verse on that, well, I can't say that because, you know, LMR, for God so loved the world, how much did you love us, that he gave his only begotten son. You can't prove it any better than by an action. You say, God loves the world, how? That he gave his only begotten son. Not one of his many sons, 
Not one of a, a multitude of things that I've got. Well, I've got, yeah, let's see what I've got in my pocket. Yeah, I've got several pennies. Give that. No, he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Isn't God good to us? Love is a fruit, as we see in this passage here. It says in verse 15, but if you bite and devour one another, the opposite of love, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. That's what's going to happen if Christ is not the center of our churches, and that's what's going to happen to churches. We're going to start biting and devouring one another until we start loving each other again. You know, sometimes we have to be brought up on a short reign, and we have to be, the Lord allows Bad things to come into our life for us to reevaluate the situation and hopefully, Lord willing, to see that we're not loving enough. Can, I, can anybody raise their hand in this room today and say, I love plenty sufficient? It's something we got to work on every day, isn't it? Because it's not, you know, the more I study the Word of God, the more I think that some of these things that we think are nouns, like love, are not actually nouns, they're actually verbs you got to keep doing them, or they don't exist. What happens when you quit paddling upstream? You start floating downstream. You're not doing it anymore. What happens when you say, when you stop performing selfless, sacrificial actions to someone that you love? Well, you've stopped loving them. You've stopped loving them. What a terrible thing that is to think about. We better get to work, huh? We better start doing the things that we need to do. The works of the flesh in verse 19 are manifest, and you go down this, this terrible list of things that we're not guilty of, surely, but yes, we are if you look down through them. But the fruit of the Spirit in verse 22, and when I go back to Big Creek, I'll read all those verses, and I'll talk about them, and I'll be up here an hour and a half. But Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. That's the first one. It's not a coincidence. You know, if you start studying the word love through the New Testament, and usually it's the first one or else it's the last one. Very rarely it's in the middle. It is sometimes. But usually it's the first one they want to catch our attention with it. Or it's the last one. It's the one they want to finish up with. You know, Brother Justin Myers was talking about the message he had to preach. He had to preach the first part. He really loved to preach the last part. And you can tell that, couldn't you? He really loved to preach that last part. That's what he was waiting on. We need to make it the first and the last part of our lives, too. The first thing we do and the last thing we do. And these other ones are all important, too. Joy and peace and long-suffering. And, and I think these all meld together to, to make a perfect fruit of the Spirit, don't they? When you bring all these fruits together. It's basically a fruit salad here, isn't it? A wonderful thing that we can have when we bring them all together gentleness, goodness, faith. You can't have none of these without love. But then you can't have love without these too, can you? They're, they're all tied together. Meekness, temperance. Against such, there is no law. Love is a fruit, first of all. Love is a lifestyle. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 1. You can go back there and read it. The Lord said you, the Lord said you need to love his commandments, and you need to love him. You need to, in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 11, verse 16 through 21, you hear these? I told Becky I was going to cut out most of my introduction. I wouldn't get to my part. But you read those verses, and the Lord says, you can't tell me that you love me if you don't love the brethren. How can you love me who you haven't seen if you don't first love the brethren? It's impossible. Try it. Your love will be so dry your love will be so brittle that it will break under the slightest pressure and it won't be of the least use to anyone if you don't love Christ first. If you don't selflessly, sacrificially act towards others as you would have them act towards you, I guess is the, uh, the golden rule. Love is a fruit, love is a lifestyle, and love is always in action, a selfless, sacrificial action. So how do we love? That's what I want to preach on this morning. The book of Romans, chapter 1. Brother Mike Sisner preached a message out of this at, up at Gladwin a couple of years ago that really blessed my heart. And uh, I just want to use the Apostle Paul's outline here. In Romans 1, 
In verse number 7, he says, To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Christ Jesus. He's got his priorities right, doesn't he? I thank my God through Christ Jesus for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. How do we love? First thing we do is we forgive them. But, Brother Matthew, you don't know what they've done. Forgive them. You cannot control whether they come up to you and say, I'm sorry. They might, and sometimes they do. Isn't that wonderful when they do? You've been hurt. You know, the bad part about this is sometimes I've hurt people and not even known I've done it. Unless they come to me and tell me, I'm oblivious to it. You can talk to my wife for a long time about how oblivious I am to everything going around about me. She says, you're in the center of your own universe. You, you, you don't understand. And she's right, I don't. I need the help of my brethren. If I've said something that offends you, don't hold it inside. You know, sometimes I have the tendency to do that. When somebody's hurt me, I have the tendency to hold it inside. And you know what it does? It just festers. And every time I think about that, brother, oh, I remember what he did to me. Oh, if only she knew what she'd done to me. Well, go tell her. Go tell them. Act on this love that you have. Make that relationship so sweet so that when you think of them the next time, what you remember is putting arms around each other and loving each other selflessly and sacrificially. That's what we got to do. We got to forgive our brothers and sisters in Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18. One of the most powerful verses on this, Peter came into him, verse 21, and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times? I'd be a pretty good guy if I forgive seven times, wouldn't I? And you all know that this has been preached to you before, but take it to heart. Don't hold it inside. Jesus said unto him, I say not only until seven times, but until 70 times seven, 490 times. And if you want to count, there's a problem here. Yeah. All right, I'm up to 437. You know, you've only got a few chances left. We got a problem. That ain't forgiven. That's why the Lord is telling us it needs to be an infinite forgiveness. Because if you love them, it doesn't matter that you're the one that always has to say, I'm sorry. How many times have I heard people say, well, I'm always the one that has to forgive. Well, praise the Lord for that opportunity that you have. And praise the Lord for the love that he's given you, that you continue doing it. What an awesome thing it is. Over in the, the Lord gives a parable about this, this servant in the next few verses, and he, and he finishes up about this servant that he forgave frankly. You, for, you remember that. You know, I, I remember one time I was reading, somebody in, in the family was wanting somebody else to forgive and, and, and come and make restitution and do this and all this, and then I'll know that you're sorry for what you've done. doesn't know the slightest thing about forgiveness. The Lord doesn't take all of our things to task. Wouldn't that be awful if the Lord took everything that we had and piled it up? Now, when you make amends for all this, then I'll forgive you. He frankly forgave us, and that's what we need to do. That's what it says over here. In verse number 33, Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due him. And you know what? He lost his forgiveness because he wouldn't forgive. So what it says in verse 35, So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts... not good enough to say I'm sorry and not mean it it's not good enough to say I'm sorry and not follow through and love them the Lord knows and everybody around you knows too you may think you're hiding it I may think I'm hiding it but everybody knows whether you've forgiven somebody or not because it's how you treat that person afterwards is it open as it was before until it's as open as it was before, or even maybe even richer and deeper, you've not really forgiven that person. If you from your hearts forgive not everyone, 
his brother to church. First thing we lo- to do to love our brethren is to forgive. You know, that would, that would basically fix everything in our churches. It would take all the bitterness, all the malice, all the anger that we, we passed over there, the fruits of the flesh. It would take all of that out of our church if we truly forgave those round about us. But you know, the Lord allows us to do more when we love them. The second thing the Apostle Paul said back there in Romans chapter 1 and verse number 9, I believe it was, he said, and I pray for you. Beloved, that's what we can do for our brethren is to pray without ceasing like the Apostle Paul said there. I got a question for you. Do you? Do you live your life praying for, you know, Big Creek Baptist Church, we got a a prayer list of folks that have requested prayer. It's not sufficient to pray one time and say, well, I've done my duty. No, we've got to continue praying for each other. We've got to pour out our hearts on specific occasions in our life, set time aside to pour out our hearts in prayer. If we haven't done that, we really haven't started praying yet. Prayer is communion. It's a two-way street. You know, so often I, I tell the flock there at Big Creek, I said, well, when you, did, when you told the Lord, thank you for the blessing, did you stop and hear him say, well, you're welcome? Because God will say you're welcome. If we, if we say thank you, Lord, and move on, we never stop to hear God say thank you, we'd miss the blessing. Wait on the Lord. If you, if you tell, if, if in our prayer life it must be a two-way street, if you tell God, I'm sorry for what I've done in a prayer of repentance, please wait until you hear him say you're forgiven. Because you might not be yet. You might not have done. We might have not have had the, the, the Lord might have not knocked us down as low as we need to really understand how bad we were. How awful it is what we've done. I'm sorry, Lord. Not enough. I want you to get down on your knees before he'll say. Before he, that's what he says here. You know, this verse right here, I go back and forth because, you know, obviously all our sins are paid for. So what could the Lord be talking about when he's, when he's talking about here? And I'm not going to preach on this passage, but all of you guys, preachers, can go take this home and preach on this. It's a difficult passage. This is one of the most important things we can do is seek forgiveness of the Lord and to pray for those round about. We cannot be too busy to pray. You have to set time aside to pray. Because you really, and and there's a lot of praying that you can do while you're driving down the road. But there's a lot of praying you can't do while you're driving down the road. That's why it says pray without ceasing. Pray constantly. We need to love them enough to make the time to pray for them. Does your wife have cancer? How much are you on your knees praying for your wife that has cancer? Why? Because you love her. Does a church member have cancer? How much time do you spend on your knees for her or for him? Depends on how much you love them, doesn't it? It really does. The next door neighbor, the prayer request by email. And I understand that there's some that we're going to spend more time on, but I want you to see it's because you love them. And I am admonishing you this morning that the most important people that I want you to spend time praying for are, Brother John's going to tell you, pray for your family. I'm telling you right now, pray for your church members. Brother Andy, I'll tell you to pray for your country. We really need to do, we need to love enough to set aside time to pray. It should now, now the word pray is P-R-A-Y. Now remember this P-R-E-Y. It should prey upon our minds to pray for others. Take that with you. It should prey upon our minds to pray for our church members. The third thing we need to do back there in Romans chapter 1 and verse number 10 and 11, he says, making request if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God. Look what he says, to come to you. You know what the Apostle Paul wanted to do? He wanted to visit. And that's what he says in verse 11. For I long to see you. I emphasize that. Did you notice? I long to see you. Oh, you're bur- it's a burden upon my heart to pray for you. I love you. I just want to be with you. You know, churches were strong when Church members love to visit each other. I think, I really think you, you examine your church and I examine my church. How many homes 
of other church members have you been in? And how many have been in your home? You know, what I love to do as pastor, and it's not, you know, I drop in unexpectedly on my members. I do. I say, I'm in the area. You know, I haven't seen Brother James for a while. I want to go check on him, see how he's doing. I pull in, and you know, he's never had to hide or never had to shut the door. Brother, you don't come in now. You know, and, I, and that's not what I'm there for. They always say, oh, so good to see you. My, my song leader, he often says it in his devotion before, there's no greater joy that I ever have in my life is to see one of my brothers and sisters in Christ pull down my driveway. Oh, what a wonderful thing it is to visit. We need to take time to visit folks in nursing homes, yes. We've got three members that are in nursing homes at Big Creek, and, and I love to go visit them, and I tell the folks in the church, please go visit them. You think that you're giving them a blessing by visiting them? You walk away from that nursing home, and Brother Dick will have said something that will bless you to your heart. Sister Martha, oh, uh, Sister Arlene, I mentioned my church members. I, I love to go visit them. I don't do it enough, but I walk away more blessed than I could have ever possibly blessed them. Visit them. Love them enough to visit them. Skip the movies. Skip the ball game for once. And go see them because you love to see them. Because you love them. Oh, what a wonderful thing it is to visit. Drop, you know, bend over backwards. Remember what love is? It's a selfless, sacrificial action. You know, it's not always the easiest thing to do. You know, and sometimes I've got a couple of my kids with me or three of my kids with me or whatever it may be. And I say, they say, where are we going when we turn? I say, we're going over to see Brother Dick. Not always. Yeah. Oh, Dad, I had things I was going to do at the house. It's not always the easiest thing to do, but it's worth it if you love them. The fourth thing we can do is in verse 11, He longed to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end that you may be established. The fourth thing we need to do to loving the life of our church life is to impart gifts to other members of the church. There are physical gifts that we can give to others. We can give fish to them. We can, we can bring, uh, when someone's sick, bring them, bring them some mashed potatoes and some pot roast or whatever it is your wife's good at making. Just go visit and, and go give them something physical. That, that's nice. When somebody has a need, sometimes the church says, I, I vote we give $200 to this person for that need. You know, physical gifts are nice, but spiritual gifts are even better. So how can I give spiritual gifts to someone? You know, maybe you could say, Brother Andy, I've got a verse that really blessed me this week. Could I get up and read that verse? You do that in Sovereign Grace Landmark Baptist Churches? Allow anybody to come up and... Yes, we do. Isn't that wonderful? When, and, and a verse that you've never see, heard, seen in that light before, by that young person coming up, that old person coming up, that middle-aged person coming up, they re read that verse in a different light than you've ever read it before. Spiritual blessing. Loving, loving the Word of God, loving to give those a song. But you don't know how much it blesses me to have special singing, to have members of the church come up and say, I've got a song I want to sing. All right. Yes. You know, get to hear the words of that song again. The fruits of the Spirit that we can give. We can give faith to someone else. We can give encouragement to someone else. We can give validation to someone else. We can give camaraderie and joy to each other. Go back and read the fruits of the spirits all over again. The fruit salad is there to be dispersed among the banquet table of the Lord's church. If we love one another, we'll do that, won't we? What a marvelous thing it is. The last thing in verse 12, he says, that, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. How marvelous it is that we can be comforted together in the Lord's church. You know, it's tough out there in the world. And it really is nice to be able to come to a church that loves each other. I don't want to be out there in the world where it's all fractured and friction and to come to a church and have the fracture and friction there too. It doesn't feed me at all. If we love one another, we need to start with our families, start with our churches, start with our governments, and let's move out from there that God will bless us with the true love. You know, the best place I can go to is Acts chapter 11 and verses 19 to 26 and the Jerusalem church sent Barnabas up there. He was a good man and a just man. And they, and they rejoiced. 
And at the end of that passage, it said they called them Christians first at Antioch because of the love that they were showing. Brother Andy. 